Our sermon series this fall is talking about finding true north. Most of, we have different thoughts in our minds, things that we pick up in the culture. And uh, some of them are, some of them are okay, but some of them are one degree off where we need to be based on at least what the Bible says. And uh, we need to pay attention to those things. Um, Today we're going to talk about some uh, belief or a thought that that I used to have, and uh, one that I hear quite a bit too. I, I don't need church to be a Christian. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But being one degree off on something, you know, you might seem like you're going in the right direction, but the farther along you go, the farther off you actually become. So um, last week I had some different maps up there. This, today I have a different one. If you go 135 miles north from this exact spot, you will end up in uh, Sleeping, Bear, uh, Sleeping Bear National Lakeshore, the, the dunes there. I don't know how many of you have been there. Okay, yeah, it's, it's a nice place. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of fun. There's some cool dunes there, great, great beaches, and of course it's Lake Michigan. If you go one degree off though, you'll, you'll end up in Glen Lake. So, if, would you rather, yeah. One degree off means either being in Sleeping Bear National Lakeshore there or in Glen Lake. So being one degree off, especially as the farther along you go, can actually make quite a bit of difference. And the farther along we go in our lives, if we're one degree off, the farther along away we'll be from where we need to be. And we've picked up some ideas from our our time, our culture, that are one degree off, and we get off God's course as we go along. And it's just part of kind of living in the the time that we are in and being around the people that we're around. There's some ideas that are one degree off, and we need to pay attention to what's real. What does the Bible actually say? And so we have a a memory verse here. Let's... uh, Let's say it together, and then we'll take it away, and we'll see if we can say it without it on the screen. All right, let's say it. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. All right, take it away. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. And uh, last week we had some bracelets that were passed out that say Romans 12, 2 on them that reminds us to stay on God's course and to be transformed and not just to go with whatever the winds are going and where we are. There's more in the back if you want them. I know um, some of them, some of you have asked if there's some any bigger and some of you have asked if there's some any smaller. They're, they're kind of one size fits all, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, if... Just you take one and put it somewhere where you can see it and remember this verse and apply it to your life and whatever you're going through at that time. All right, not being conformed, but being transformed. So, I don't need church to be a Christian. This is a one degree off idea. So, for example, there's... A celebrity out there that many of you have probably heard of, his name is Justin Bieber, the Biebs, if you will. He has a uh, quote there, I think I have that on the screen there, where he says, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. If you go to Taco Bell, that doesn't make you a taco. And this, this is kind of a prevailing opinion right now. Um, I was having a conversation with uh, one of our elders not that long ago, and he was uh, recalling a conversation that, that he had, and this was kind of interesting. There was a, a 36-year-old um, who's raised in the church, but he hasn't been to church since college, and this is what he said, heaven does not only take those who congregate. In other words, you don't have to join together with anybody to congregate together to go to heaven. And the conversation continued from there. But heaven does not only take those who congregate. Now, 
there's some truth in, in some of this. It sounds right because it does have some truth. It's not just categorically false. I mean, church membership doesn't make us true believers. I think that's fair to say. I don't think I have to explain that or, or defend that too much. Uh, church attendance doesn't make us true worshipers. You know, we can, we can be sitting here and we can be going through the motions and our heart can be somewhere else entirely. I mean, that doesn't, just because we're here doesn't mean that we're actually worshiping with our hearts. I mean, that seems fair to say, doesn't it? And uh, I mean, I read about different persecuted Christians around the world and I remember reading once about there was this woman in Somalia where in Somalia the percentage of Christians there is like less than 1% and she has no access to any other believers at all and so she doesn't get to go to church as much as she would love to. So, I mean, there's people like that too. So there's some truth in that. But let's look at what Ephesians 2 says. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. That's what we're going to read today. It says, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at one time, at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has droid destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit." Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Okay, being in Christ, if you are in Christ, that means being together. This whole passage basically talks about in in Christ, we're together. So in verse 12 there, it says, it talks about being separate from Christ, which means it uses the word excluded. In the Greek, it actually uses, or could actually be translated strangers. Are, Are you a stranger to God's people? Um, from citizenship, it talks about being part of Christ means that you're like a citizen of a nation. Um, and then foreigners to the covenant. Are, are we foreigners to, to God's people? And then it says, being so is to be without God. So in order to be in Christ, we need to be together. This is, this is what it's, this is talking about here. And then in verse 16 here, this, this kind of stands out to me. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility, we are reconciled to God in one body, not scattered individuals. Reconciled to God, we're, we're made right with God altogether. It's, it's about being together that we are made right with God. So, heaven doesn't only take those who congregate. does not fit very well with this verse at all. This verse is basically saying, we congregate and therefore we are saved. 
We are actually, and a number of verses talk about this, I don't have time to go through them all, but we are saved as a group, not as individuals. There's a lot of verses that talk about our, our salvation is, is together, as the church. So, Acts 20, 28, I'll just mention this one. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Christ died for the church, his people, his bride. In the Bible, when it talks about these covenants and these promises, they're not just made with individuals, they're made with families to you and your descendants after you. We're talking about groups of people here. In Ephesians 5, it talks about how Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church. And we are saved because we are a part of God's family. Christ is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. So when the Bible talks about the church, the, the people of God, it uses a bunch of different images. It uses a bride, and a husband, and a, and a wife. It talks about family, how we belong together as one family of God. And so we call God our Father for that reason. And it talks about here, right here, it talks about being a temple to the Lord. So in verse 21, it kind of hits, hits that there. In Christ, we all join and fit together, growing into the temple. So we're, we're all together, we're, we're kind of like a building. We don't have a temple anymore in Jerusalem where we have to go there and we have to do sacrifices and we need priests to offer sacrifices for us anymore. No, we're, we're a priesthood of all believers and all together we are a temple, a building of the living God. So to say, to say I don't need church is kind of like playing Jenga with God's temple. So this is the communion table here. This is supposed to represent the communion that we have with one another. And so if, uh, if we are saying, oh, I don't need the church, and this happens, if this, we can call this, you know, the, the temple building of God, and we start pulling out some of these here, you know, it's not, how long is it going to take before the whole building topples over? And even if we just take out one, the structure is a lot less, less supported than it was before. How many of these can we take out before, before things start to collapse? And usually when we take ourselves out of church, what happened? I know, how many? I mean, that's, that's a question. But even, at, even with this here, you could just blow it over. When we take ourselves out of the body of Christ, look what happens to the church. <laughs> I don't need church. There goes the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3, it says this, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you, you yourselves, are that temple. This is some serious stuff here. And the temple analogy is is actually kind of generous because there's one more analogy that the Bible uses to talk about the church. And that's a body. A human body. You start taking out parts of a body, it gets devastating real quick. Much, much less that. I mean, can you imagine, start pulling out your, your, your liver, or your intestines, and miss, going missing those? Now we're in big trouble, real fast. As believers, we need each other as body parts need a body. So, 1 Corinthians 12 there. The body is a unit, and though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, 
whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Again, one. We're, we're a body. We, we belong together. And then Jesus said this in John 15, 4 through, 1 and 4 through 6. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Oh, I have that up there. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. We need, we need the body of believers. If we're separated from that body, that's pretty devastating. You know what they call a body that's not joined together? A corpse. Dead. So, I mean, if you want to be really strict about it to say, I don't need the church to be a Christian, okay, fine, in maybe some technical sense, maybe that, that's true. But you might as well say, I don't need my hand to be alive. Might as well just cut it off. But who does that? I don't need my sight to live. Sure, you can, you can blind me, that's fine. No big deal. Who says that? Nobody does. I don't need any limbs or senses at all. I mean, really, I mean, we could still survive without any arms or legs and without any of our senses. We'll, we'll, still, we'll still survive, won't we, right? That'd be pretty devastating, though, wouldn't it? A finger that's separated from the hand has, has no life in it. The body must be together, and we must be building each other up. Because when you're in your body and in mine, everything has to work together for us to be healthy. If something goes wrong, everything goes wrong. And so we need to serve one another. We not only need to be together, we need to be serving each other. If my liver suddenly decided that it didn't want to serve the rest of the body anymore, I'd be in big trouble real fast. Or if my heart started, decided it didn't want to pump blood anymore, I'd be in big trouble real fast. We need to serve one another. A body part that doesn't serve the body is, is dead. So church membership is not required to be saved or anything like that, no. But it does mean that you are committed to serve. It means you are not a follower in the body of Christ. You are someone who serves. And that means you are committed to serve. If you've made a public profession here in this church, part of that means that you are committed to serve this group of people, this body of believers, and the whole church for that matter, but especially these people here. Being part of the body, but not serving, is actually called a parasite. It means you're feeding off of everything else, but you're not contributing anything to it. So imagine, imagine you're, you're, you end up, you're, you're in heaven and, and you're standing before God on, on the last day and, and uh, you, you find out that you, you were a parasite. Like, let's say, let's say you were the tapeworm in the body of Christ. How, how would you like to be that? You're, you're just feeding off of everything else but not giving anything back. Let's not be tapeworms. Let's be parts of the body. Look at the screen here with me if you would, and let's answer the question together. We just said the Apostles' Creed a little bit ago. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that believers, one and all, as members of this community, share in Christ and in all His treasures and gifts. Second, that each member should consider it a duty 
to use these gifts readily and cheerfully for the service and enrichment of the other members. When we say the communion of saints in the Apostles' Creed, this is what it means. We're here to serve one another. We're here to build each other up. We're here to help each other. And if we're not doing that, that's bad news. Not just for us, but for everybody. And while we're talking about the church, the single most important function of church is worship. What we're doing right now. Why we're here today, right this minute. God must be worshipped. If there's anything that's true about God, it's this. God must be worshipped. In the Bible, the, word, the phrase, praise the Lord, is in there 67 times. Praise the Lord. It's, a, it's actually a command. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The whole reason why we have missions, I've heard this quote a few times before and I think there's a lot of truth in it. Missions exist because worship doesn't. The reason why we send out missionaries and we witness at all is because there's people out there who don't worship God and God must be worshipped. They need to know who this God is and realize that this God is great and they need to worship Him. And we can say God is the most important thing in our lives and that is, that's very true and, and that should be true. But if God is truly the greatest then worship is our greatest purpose. That, that should be the most important thing in our lives. More, more than anything else. When um, Deirdre and I were in, on spring break, we were in New York City. And on Sunday, we went to the 9-11 Memorial Museum. And it was a great museum. And we thought, okay, we looked up times for, for church. It was a church that I was kind of interested in, in going to. And so we thought, okay, church starts at 5. We got there at like noon or 11 or something like that. Okay, we got plenty of time and church is just around the corner. We can do that. Well, this museum was really, really interesting. It was really engrossing and just, and it was a lot bigger than we thought. And yeah, we just kind of got lost in there, lost track of time. And, and boy, it was a great museum. And there were, it, it felt like it was really important to be here because this was a monumental event that happened in, in our country and for the world, uh, that matter. And, and there was lots of people who died here tragically. And, and it felt really important to, to be there, to, to hear those stories and to, to see what happened there. And before you knew it, it was past five o'clock. We had missed church. And at first, I thought, well, I'm on vacation. You know, this is, this is an important museum, and, and uh, it's important to see, so maybe, yeah, it's no big deal, you know? I mean, I go to church all the time, right? No. I just blew off the most important person in my life. That, that, that was, that's tragic. That's sad. That should not have happened. I mean, as important as that museum was, I, I didn't take time for the most important thing. Missing worship should be a last resort. A last resort. Something you cannot avoid. I could have avoided it. We could have avoided it. We didn't. We could have been there. Now, for those of you who are a little older in, in the room here, you probably grew up with all kinds of rules about what you could and couldn't do on Sunday. And some of you, if you're even a little older, you probably even remember cooking all the food on Saturday so that you'd be ready for Sunday. And, and there were all these rules that went in. I was talking with somebody in our church just this week who said, I wasn't allowed to pick up scissors on Sunday. When I was a kid and I got these paper dolls, I was going to cut, cut them out. It was 
for, got it for Christmas, and then um, Sunday was like the next day, and I was going to cut those out, and, and mom said, nope, no scissors on Sunday. My, my dad, um, he lived on a lake, and, and they, they had a boat, and he was allowed to, to ride in the boat on Sunday, but he wasn't allowed to go water skiing on Sunday. Some, some of these rules, you know, we think, oh, that's, that's kind of silly, and, and some of them kind of were, you know? But for all of those silly rules, these people knew the importance of worship. They had it in their minds that God must be worshipped and we are going to do whatever it takes to make sure that happens. So we can shake our heads at some of those rules, but they knew the importance of worship. We can't shake our heads at that. If our activities, our our concerns, other things that we're doing are getting in the way of worship, we need to change our lives. God must be worshipped. There's nothing more important for us to do in life at all. Scheduling your week around worship is actually what the fourth commandment talks about. We would never think of murdering anybody or, or committing adultery or robbing a bank. But those are commandments 6, 7, and 8. This one is number 4. God must be worshipped. Organize your entire life around this day of worship. Because this must happen. We should, I mean, theoretically, God deserves all of our time. We should be worshipping constantly. But God says, no, I just, one day. Let's set aside one day for worship. And you, you make that day important. You make it holy. If you do your Bible readings this week, you're going to read Jeremiah where God is really upset about how people are just doing whatever they want on Sunday. It's like it's, like it's no big deal. There's nothing holy about that day at all. So saying we don't need to go to church, don't need to worship, I mean, can you imagine saying, we don't need sports? The, the kids with all of their sports activities, eh, no, we don't need that. We're not going to do it. Uh, we're not going to turn, turn the game on at all. We're not going to watch any games ever again. We don't need to. That makes more sense. But can you imagine doing that? How about, I don't need ice cream. Who wants to do that? We don't need it. How about... How about, let's, let's never eat meat again. How would you like that? Our bodies don't need it, technically. Actually, I've even read before, and maybe some of you could correct me on this, I don't know, but I've read before that we could theoretically only live on avocados. Let's just eat avocados only all the time, and we'll be set. We don't need anything else. But can you imagine that happening? How about, I don't need TV. How many people who have gone before us survived just fine without TV? We don't need that. How about, I don't need Facebook or social media. How are the internet all together? Let's just, let's just not use it. We don't need it. And, and, and I know some of you here, you don't even have a computer. Some of you don't even know how to turn a computer on. So let me, let me hit another one here. I don't need coffee. Can you imagine saying that? God must be worshipped. Say, I don't need to worship makes less sense than any of those things. And let's be honest here. To say, I don't need really means I don't care. Let's be honest. Whenever we say, I don't need something, what we're really saying is, I don't care. Let's just be honest about that. What's really concerning is not that your backside's not in a pew on Sunday morning. What's really concerning is if we're saying, I don't care. We have a God who is the greatest thing ever. 
And he must be worshipped. And we're saying we don't care. That's concerning. That's actually called sloth or apathy or indifference. Those are, those are very serious conditions of our hearts that we need to pay attention to. Now, I know a lot of you out there have loved ones, friends, family members who, who are in this situation. They, they say, I don't need church to be a Christian. I don't care. Now, if you have a loved one like that who's not part of a church, who's not, not worshiping, don't fret over their salvation because we're not saved because our backside's in a pew. That's not what saves us. And if you have that on your mind, then we're going to kind of give that impression. We don't want that. We're saved by grace. We're saved by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's what's important. And don't guilt them into coming either. We don't want people sitting here today just because they'll feel guilty if they don't. That's not good reason for worship either. Keep inviting them. Keep inviting them. It just keeps reminding them that this is important and that we need to do this. God must be worshiped. And invite anybody to church at all. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If there's somebody who walks in those doors, whoever they are, whatever they've done, if they're here to worship, they're welcome. That should be the bottom line because God must be worshipped. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, whatever you look like, doesn't matter. If you're, if you're here to worship God, you are welcome because God must be worshipped. And that should be the end of it. Keep inviting them and, and pray for them because, because it is important that we are together as a body of believers. And this is a matter of a heart. Again, it's not a matter of a backside and a seat. It's a matter of a heart. It's saying, I don't care. Because the bottom line is that we all need the church and the church needs us. We all need the church. The church needs us. 1 Corinthians 12, the body is not made up of one part. We're not individuals, but of many. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? We all need each other. And we all need to be together so that we are growing in Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our God in heaven, you are great and glorious. You deserve our worship today. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be in it. That we would not be here just out of, out of guilt or, or ritual, but Lord, that we would be here because you deserve our worship and our attention today. Lord, for those of us who are not here, we, we pray for them. Um, some of them are here, are not here for different reasons. And, and Lord, we, we ask that uh, if there's anyone out there who's not, there, not here today because they're saying in one way or another that they don't care, uh, Lord, please, please work on them. Uh, Lord, help us to keep inviting them and just to remind them that, that, Lord, you deserve our worship, not to guilt them, not to make it about salvation, but, Lord, about you and who you are. Please keep that on, on our minds always. Keep us on your straight and narrow so that we'd be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In the name of Jesus, amen.